Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You might have noticed we've had a few technical hitches today, but we've tried to overcome them. Um, I hope you've all had coffee. I hope on the way out, you will take lots of cake with you, because <laughs> we have an awful lot. And we're going to cut up the cake and back it up in serviettes like wedding cake. So you can take a bit of birthday cake home with you. Thank you very much indeed for coming. It's lovely to see so many people here and a great relief. Um, we're now, now we're saying happy birthday. Uh, nobody would have missed the fact that on this very day, five people got together in a room above a church in Oxford and officially decided to become the Oxford Committee for Famine Relief. And it's on this very day, is the birthday. Wow. So that's very special, isn't it? Yeah. I'd like to introduce some, some visitors we have. Um, we have Emma and Chrissy, who come from the uh, supporter, uh, the Oxfam supporter fundraising group. Um, do they want to stand up? Or... I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where Chrissy is. She's around somewhere. <laughs> and we have Michelle from Global Wash. Global Wash. Michelle told me all about Global Wash. And we have Emma, who is here, <laughs> who is going to talk to David in a minute. And of course, we have David, who has patiently patiently waited in the kitchen and in the other room and, and been very patient and thank you very much. Now, um, the uh, first thing we're going to do is that um, Michelle is going to talk to us. No, I'm sorry. David and Emma first. Oh, David and Emma first. I beg your pardon. David and Emma first. Um, David is going to answer some questions that we have asked him if he would do that. So it's going to be not so much to, a talk in the form of an interview. And so please welcome David Thank you. Are we okay to sound? Yeah. How's the audience? Did it sound okay? Yeah. 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 Yes. We can start. Okay. Brilliant. What are you going to ask me? Not, not, <laughs> so if, just to say that I've got my phone here. I'm not checking my phone. I've just got a timer on, so you might hear a beep at the end. That's what that is. But, um, I just want to say thank you so much for coming along today. So sure. Time for your birthday party. And look how long she's been organising. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, Barbara's amazing, and um, and you're amazing, and we just can't wait to hear. Um, about the stories you've got to tell us. Oh, okay. Um, Fire about away. your amazing career. Mm. So um, you grew up in Bridge End in Wales in the I 1950s. Did. I did. And I imagine um, going into fashion and dress designing wasn't a typical career for a boy in Wales. Indeed, you're quite right. So yes. um, <laughs> how come how come that happened to you? Um, or you made it happen? Well, first of all, I was from a Welsh-speaking family. So when I went to school, I don't know if they knew language called English. <laughs> and then um, I went to obviously primary school, general school, and then I went to senior school. Now, I'm the Welsh, as you're probably aware, quite musical. So I used to, in my youth, I used to do a lot of singing, reciting. Um, when I got to senior school, well, I was playing the piano very young. So when I went to senior school, um, I took up the violin and became leader of the school orchestra. And then in between, I used to dodge certain. Um, lectures. <laughs> a lot of them. I had to hide in the music room, so I taught myself the cello. And then, um, when it came to the time when everybody was figuring out what they were going to do, I didn't know what, what to do. I loved art, and I loved music. So I went to my music teacher. He said, well, you should apply to music college. And I went to my art teacher. No, 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 you've got to go to art college. So I applied to both. And the letter came through, first of all, for my art college, saying, congratulations, you've got to be in college, college of art. And then about a month later, the music college go, congratulations, you've got a place. Wow. So I had to decide, and it was a big decision, um, but I was passionate uh, about art. And I don't know if you know anything about art education. When you go initially, um, you have what they call a foundation. You do a bit of everything, uh, 
graphics, uh, painting, and um, I floated into the fashion department. There were some pretty girls, I thought, oh, I can do this. <laughs> I get this a piece of cake. So I ended up doing fashion. I was, there was three, three of us, three boys, the rest were all girls, and the other guys dropped out, and I persevered. And um, it was a very interesting education because you realize how competitive, even at that stage, how competitive it was. I started winning a few competitions, then all the girls didn't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, right, competition. And then I was very lucky, I then, I completed a three-year course in two years. I transferred to Harry's School of Art, where I met Elizabeth, my, my ex-wife. And we then went, uh, that was my step stone to the Royal College of Art. And Elizabeth and I were the first married couple ever to go to the Royal College of Art. Yeah. So we went in as David and Elizabeth Emanuel, and, um, and that's how it started. Yes, well, how, you're an incredibly creative person to yeah. have those options of, you know, be accepted by music school and uh, art school. Yeah. But you made the right choice, and you got to the wedding, and then you went on to design the most famous wedding dress in yeah. history ever. That was extraordinary. When I look, as you know, we've celebrated uh, Diana's birthday recently and her anniversary, and of course all those memories come flooding back. That's all I can say. It was such a pleasure to do. I mean, the, 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 the kindest, sweetest girl in the entire world. Really? And I want to have one, not one um, member of the press saying, you know, anything derogatory about her. Because quite simply, I said, they said, oh, she was this, she was that. I said, oh, really, did you ever meet her? And they well, no. I said, well, it's all over. I said, had you met her, you realised she was very special. And it was a simple phone call to my studio. Mm. And would you do the honour of making my wedding dress? Oh. <laughs> How did you feel when you got that? Well, call? shocked, uh, exhilarated, uh, excited. Um, you have to remember, we were, Elizabeth and I at the time were only out of the Royal College for two or three years. Wow. And we were rank outsiders, so reading in the press, Zandra Rhodes is going to do the dress, or Belfast and Soon is going to do the dress, or you name it, we were never mentioned. But um, what happened was, uh, Vogue magazine were doing a shoot on beauties, and Diana was, so we didn't know this, so Diana was called in, and we, they rang, said, could you send something in? I said, well, for whom? Is it a model girl? They wouldn't say. I said, okay, we happened to have a pink blouse, and we made a quick a pink taffeta skirt, sent it in, and she went along the racks and she said, that one, I want to wear that. And that's what happened. Lord Snowden was doing the pictures, and suddenly, that was her engagement picture. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and she said at the time, well, who, who's these clothes? And they said, Emmanuel. And like any other client, she rang up and made an appointment and came in. We didn't know. There was nothing in the press about Diana. And she was sweet and she was charming, and she said, oh, I'm going somewhere lovely, and I said, well, try this on. We'll try that on, and we were both, you know, Elizabeth and I were beavering around and trying to, we had some clothes obviously hanging up. And um, much later to find out, I said, you know when you first came in, where were you going, you wanted some, she said it was Prince Andrew's birthday, Buckingham Palace. <laughs> that was the first one. And there were several dresses later, but she came in this one particular time, she said, help, I'm going somewhere really posh. Oh, <laughs> where, where are you going? <laughs> And, and she wouldn't say, and I said, okay, well, how are you getting, very important, you see, it's not just designing a frock. You've got to take into consideration the entire thing. I said, how are you getting there? And she said, oh, by car. I said, that's okay. Um, when you go, it always when, you need to know the deadline. And she explained where, and I said, well, that's okay. But I said, you know, we happen to have a black, you know, you, you, know, the dress. <laughs> you know the famous dress. I think the press called it the black dress. And she was young. You have to remember she was 18, just, you know, very young, pale, beautiful skin, blonde hair, blue eyes, fell in love with guys. Oh my God. And uh, I said, okay, so you put this strapless dress on. I said, we need to tweak it a bit. I said, well, you can't arrive at any, you know, with just a strapless dress. We made a little, little throw, a little cape. So she felt a little bit covered. And literally, 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 that day, we tissued it up, sent it off to Diana. And uh, we got home from our studio, so I switched on the TV, and I go, this car pulled up on News at 10, and out got Prince Charles, and it was Diana. I said, oh my God, that's the girl. That's her. And I said, oh my God. 
So, and, and the next day, uh, Buckingham Palace rang the press office and said, Mr. Manville, yes, hello, good morning. Uh, Buckingham Palace press office, were you responsible for the Lady Diamond's dress? I said, yes, you know, thank the Lord. Everybody's ringing up, wanted to know who designed it. And, that, and that's how we got to know Diana. Wow. And then, then cut a long story, um, and then out of the blue, we read all this in the press, so-and-so's going to do it. It was announced then officially that she's going to get married. And the phone call came, would we do the honour of making her gown? And that changed my entire life. Mm -hmm. yes. Really? Yes. I mean, I've got a couple of questions for you now. So I'd like to tell us a little bit more about the gown itself, how long it took oh, you to make Lord. it, how you came up with the concept. Well, I, I, it's a very good question, yeah. but there's so many questions over the years we've been asked. How many metres, how many this, how many that, how many sequins? So we decided actually to put it all in the book. You've seen the book here. The little bookshop nearby is supplying the books. Um, now, can you tell me? We have some next. And we decided after many years that to close the chapter was to put pen to paper and write about it because everybody around the world was saying texts and, and, and emails and mm. what. So we decided, well, so really from the date of when she asks us to the date of the wedding, it took all that time. We were starting with nothing. We did our research, Elizabeth and I did our research, and we discovered that all the royal brides was very English, very British. So, well, very difficult at the time to get British fabric. Well, luckily, we had a, a, a letter from, from a silk farm, and they said, we produce silk. Great. So you wouldn't normally I'd go to Paris or Switzerland for silk. So I said, okay, if you produce, well, can you feed them? We need lots of silk. <laughs> <laughs> feed them a lot of silk, whatever. And, and then uh, people wrote, and we said, okay, so we've got the silk. Hopefully they were produced lots of silk. Then we found a weaver up in north of England. So we said, well, if we could supply them with silk, can you weave it? And, um, and that's how it happened. So we wanted to make it totally, totally British. And we read up our history, you know, Queen Victoria. Um, she was the first one. She was the first one to do. Are we having moved on? Something's happening. Uh, she was the first one uh, that she did a white wedding gown. You know, up to that time, all the wedding gowns were coloured until Queen Victoria came along. And she said, I want white and I want it English. And that's what's happened. So we, we thought, yeah, well, let's keep the tradition. You know, we should be proud of, you know, what we offered. And we, we used to have a huge, as you know, a huge industry. Unfortunately, it's diminished uh, with weavers and, and, and all the British quality people. Um, so that's what we did. And by chance, by chance, we used to go to um, an auctioneer it's around the corner from my studio. Um, we used to buy bags. Before it was fashionable for antique place, we used to be bags at Ladies of a certain age would go into their attics and donate it to, or, or sell them to auction houses. We would buy bags and stuff, and we'd open it in our studio. And you never knew what ribbon, beautiful things, buttons. And we found this piece of lace. I said, oh, this is a really pretty piece. So we, as usual, we'd send it off to the Royal School of Needlework, and I used to clean it, put it all in tissue, and send it back to us. And in those days, we were using a lot of antique lace on our gowns. But the head of the Royal School of Music, Graham, says, Mr. Manning, I think we need a meeting. Oh, well, I paid my bills. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she told us, she'd found, she thought, we're cleaning this. This particular piece of lace was Queen Anne's. And in those days, a lot of the ladies would have a piece of lace, and then when they got tired of the gown, they used to take the lace off and put it on another gown. She said, this is Queen, uh, Queen Mary's. I said, oh Lord. So I remember saying to Diana, I said, look, we've got a piece of lace that we'd love to put on, on the front panel of your gown. I said, what do you think? And she said, oh yes, or should we check, you know? So I said, well, there was no interference from back in the palace at all. We had a free reign, there was no red tape. So I thought it'd be rather nice to put a roll piece of lace back onto a future reward wedding dress. And she loved the idea. And um, but it was hours and hours of work. It was a labor of love. Mm. And, uh, you know, kept on thinking, oh, I'm going to finish this dress in time. <laughs> well, you have to. There's no, this was not a dress rehearsal. <laughs> and um, everybody hands on deck helping. Um, and it was quite amazing. But it wasn't until the press got involved. 
And they said, you know this is going to be the most important wedding dress of the century. Oh my God. <laughs> so stop reading the papers. Because it was getting, you know, and the TV companies were getting revved up. And we were getting invitations from French TV, German TV, could we do the interview? Well, what could you say? We, we're thrilled, we're delighted, but that's all we could say. We're not going to give, give up the, the, the show, you know what I mean? So it was quite extraordinary. And the, the thing I think that helped us was the three of us. It was Elizabeth, myself, and Diana. And she had a great sense of humor. And, and that kept us going, because otherwise you get, to, some people could get hysterical doing this <laughs> extraordinary dress. Yes. Well, no, 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 she was very, you know, she was great, full of life. And, and, and eyes sparkling, and she used to come in, and we, went, we had to do the bridesmaids. I said, darling, can we arrange? We, we, you know, we do the twelve first in cotton, check everything, and then we cut it in the cloth. But we shall answer in the, you know, the weavers. <laughs> How are you getting on with the silk? We need it. <laughs> and um, and she, these little girls came in, you know, Clementine Hammer and all of the, and Princess Margaret's daughter, Lady Sarah Armstrong Jones. They all came in roller skates. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, I had all these children skating <laughs> on my lovely blonde carpet. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I said, no, so just stand still. I got to check all the lengths of the hems. And they were excited, and Danny was wonderful with them. They were so excited to see her. And then, and, and that then, I realized, okay, we got our hands full on at Clarence House the day of the wedding. So I banished, I didn't banish them, but I put all the children in one bedroom and Diane in another bedroom to keep, to keep the calm, you know. And um, yeah, it was an extraordinary time. Um, and it's not until there's situations like this when you relive it. You know, it's, it's wonderful, wonderful memories. And, and fortunately, you know, we went on to do many tours for Diane when she was doing foreign tours. Um, those were fun. And, and, but she used to ring on a Monday, hi, it's me. Hello, me. She never said it was Diana. Hello, it's me. I said, hello, me. Yes. She goes, I'm going somewhere very special on Friday. Okay. That's your deadline. It's Monday morning. Okay. Wow. We have to race around quick to Kensington Palace. Do a quick split. Where are you going? What are you doing? Because you need to know the mood. You know, is it a cocktail dress? Is it an evening gown? Is it a ball gown? What's the gig? And she used to tell us, a quick, quick squiggle, quick and then race around them with some fabrics to show her. And then Friday, tissued, and off it went. <laughs> and, then, and then the next day in the press, you know, I remember it, uh, every time Diana wore anything, it was in the press. How, how was that for you, having the press interpretation of what you'd well, made? Well, it, it, it was exciting because you never know what to expect. Yeah. I mean, very, very speed, they all said very nice things, but um, no, it was exciting. Mm. It couldn't wait. And, um, you know one thing about her, and I'll tell you, this is the true, true case of a real lady. Without question, she would then write a handwritten note, a little card saying, thank you so much, I know you're very busy, thank you for doing so quickly. You know, that's, that's class. Yes. That's style. Yes. Mm -hmm. She sounds like a beautiful person inside Oh, her. you have no idea. Yes. And, and wicked eyes, twinkling eyes. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> She used to come from pit, I'm very brief, she used to come from pit and she used to come from the front door, up the stairs, onto the landing. And there, that, that was where we saw our clients, push the double doors into the tiny little show, all mirrored to make it look larger than it was. And it was a curtain. And she used to come to the shop and say, what's up there? I said, you don't, you don't go up there. I know, that you, you're here. You don't go past this curtain. Because that's where the workrooms were, this is where the, the office was and the kitchen. I'm not sure clients that. She goes, I want to, no, you're not going up there. <laughs> you are not going up there. Oh, okay. And I slipped up one day. She wasn't expected. I was out on, on, a, a, on a, I think I was going to my hat at Freddie Fox, organising some hats for a client or for a show. And I came back and I thought, I pressed the buzzer and the, my, unit, my PA would open the door. Nothing. So I key out, opened the door, went up the stairs. Petticoats all over the place. I thought, what the heck is going on here? <laughs> Went upstairs then to, to, to the, all my ladies in the workroom were sobbing. I said, well, there's somebody dying. What's happened? Went up again to the kitchen. My PA was sobbing. I said, what a, uh, because right at the top of the house, there's a tiny, tiny studio we were making the gown. And I put a big sign saying, keep out. <laughs> and we only had two seamstresses working on the gown. And I thought, what the heck? Everybody's crying. I have, 
slid the door open, there was Diana with a big grin on her face. She said, I told you I'd come up here. And she got there. I said, what are you doing here? You shouldn't see all this. And I wanted to thank all the girls, all the ladies who've been working. It was very kind and very sweet. They were all sobbing. It took them a day to get first. Right, they need to get back to work and all the to do. What story? Yeah. And I need to ask you about another story because yep. apparently you met the Queen Mother oh. just before Diana was about to walk down the oh, aisle. Don't. It was a very entertaining don't. I don't know if you've heard this story. I have said it once or twice, but I will recap for you. There we were, dressed up in my wing collar cravat. Uh, and we were, Elizabeth and I were going between two bedrooms, making sure that the children were fine, get them dressed the last minute because we didn't want sweets or gum all over their gowns. And keeping, Diana was very calm. We were watching on a little TV. She was at her dressing table, and we saw the guards on the TV. We looked out of the window, and there they were going down the mound. <laughs> that was bizarre. Yes. That was very bizarre. And keep everything bubbling. Anyway, time to get her dressed. Right, darling, come on, in. Right, so. Makeup would be done, hair had been done, uh, got her into the dress, and then the tiara and everything fixed. Yeah. And I just happened to say to Diana, I said, Daddy, did you check the hook on the petticoat? You know, because you're, you're busy. She goes, no, I got that. Oh, no. I had visions, even walking into St. Paul, <laughs> and this petticoat <laughs> going in a different direction. Like, I said, oh, no, no, no. I said, well, there's only one way, up and under. So, <laughs> up for the dress, underneath the petticoat. And I'm on my hands and he's checking, checking the hook on the petticoat. The hook was there. And as I came out from under these, this huge crinoline, Diana said, David, have you met the Queen Mother? <laughs> <laughs> and she is standing there. And I went, as red as a beetroot. <coughs> I went, oh, lordy. And I said, okay. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and she gave what I call a quizzical look. <laughs> Like, what on earth is he doing under her dress? You know? <laughs> and then that was quite fun. Um, and then, yeah, and then they, you saw the rest. It was all on television. Yeah, and then they all, yeah but that was fun. And she stood like... <laughs> <laughs> you know the Queen Mother? She used to have that look sometimes. Like, what, what's going on here? You know? But it was fun. A fun memory. Amazing. So you've, um, as well as uh, Princess Diana, you've dressed some of the world's most famous women. So among them... Um, Madonna, yes. Shirley Bassey, yes. Elizabeth Taylor, yes. Joan Collins. Lots of dames. James. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All of those are dames. Yeah. Well, Madonna, Madonna's yeah. not a dame. Jane Seymour and Ivana Trump. Yes. So, to name but a few. Yes. yes. So, out, of, out of that selection of amazing women, who is your favourite to be? Don't around? expect me to ask. <laughs> <laughs> are you serious? Oh, no, 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 come on. Every, you never know when the phone call goes. You never know. It could be very exciting. I always think the next client is exciting. Otherwise, if you're not excited, well, you shouldn't be doing it. What was it like working with Jane Shirley Bassey? Shirley Bassey, let me just tell you about this Bassey. First of all, she's Welsh, but that's got nothing to do with it. I'm it. <laughs> um, she has extraordinary, she has a firm body. No. A very firm body. She goes to the gym every day. And I went once and we were at a reception for the BBC in Wales. And I hadn't seen her for a while. So Danny how and I grabbed her and I went, God grief. This is not boning, she is solid. Mm -hmm. And she works out at the gym. Yeah, she's in great shape. And like Tom Jones, she exercises the voice every day. And that's why she's so amazing. Mm -hmm. This I you wouldn't need a microphone if Shirley was here. She'd blow the ceiling up. <laughs> no, no, she's a great lady. Incredible voice. Um, in so something completely different now. Mm -hmm. So in 2013, yeah. you took part in the TV program I'm a Celebrity. Yes. Get me out of here. <laughs> yes. 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 Jungle, and you came second place. I did. I was rather <laughs> up. So, um, <laughs> well, I was on, I've been asked several times. I said, no, no, please. It's dirty, it's disgusting. I don't like getting dirty at the best of time. I'm smelly. And... No, 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 no. And then actually, in Fort Well, I got uh, diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer. And any of you who have been touched by cancer, you know it's, it's your life stopped. And I saw my physician, saw the consultant, and I came out of that because when you get told that news, you think, I think the majority of people think you're going to die. You don't know if it's spread, if it's early or not. And any of our men here, 
All you men, you get a simple blood test, because I'm campaigning now for Macmillan, because I'm ambassador for Macmillan. You've got to get tested. Quite simple, it's a blood test. You ladies are fabulous, you have your bosoms done, whatever, you just do it automatically. The men are shockingly bad. Um, and because of that, um, uh, you know, I, luckily, I came out of it, with keyhole surgery, with nothing. I didn't have to have um, chemotherapy, nothing. And I was very lucky, and I thought, you know what, I've been given a second chance here. Had, I, had it not been discovered, I could be dead. You know, I mean, it's very quick. Everybody knows, surely by now, with cancer, the earliest you get it, the quicker you have the success. Mm -hmm. And you've got to get checked. Men, particularly, there's a few men here, get checked. It's very simple. Um, and what we found at Macmillan, sorry, not talking about Oxon, but <laughs> with Macmillan, um, there were men as young as 30 with two children, yeah. undiscovered, dying. Because it's undiscovered. So, you know, um, got to get checked. And so when they asked me that, the, so a year to the day I had my operation, I was in the Australian jungle. Oh. <laughs> right. A year to the day. And I was just fearless. I didn't care. If I survived cancer, can I survive this jungle thing? Well, it, I've seen it on television and Listen, it's not glamorous, it's hideous. It's, and you are literally on the edge of starving. That's why a lot of the celebrities that go a bit kooky. <laughs> because they miss their chocolate and their cigarettes and their booze. And I was just very calm. I thought, no, no, it's not going to get hysterical. And the girls would oh, you know what it is, don't you? It's, it's a water challenge. I said, we don't know. Let's get there. Let's find out. Let's not waste our energy. Let's see what it is. And it, it was pretty horrendous, but, and you are on the edge, and people do change. You starve people for three days, they go a bit bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I kept calm, and I don't know how I got there. I remember it was Keen Egan, you know, from the boy band Westlife, the big singer from Westlife, and myself, and I said, why am I here? And he said, well, I don't know why I'm here either. <laughs> we got through it. Um, uh, but I tell you what, there was, who was the actress, that lovely actress from Emmerdale? Uh, she's one of the Dingles, I can't remember her name, wonderful actress. Um, and she, she and I, I thought, I, this is getting so boring. I thought, I've got, to, I've got to get out of this. So we invented, well, I invented two characters. One was Gwen from South Wales, and she used to work in the fish and chip shop. <laughs> <laughs> and her sister Cordelia was in Cheltenham. Very different lifestyle. So I used to wake, she and I always used to wake up first in camp every morning. So I said, how's Cordelia? Oh, Cordelia's very busy, she's going shopping. <laughs> oh, Mark, how's it going? Oh, Gwen's fed up. She can't wash the fat out of her hair. And that's how we kept the band to go in, to keep it, yes. you know, we had different scenarios every day. And she was great. Yeah. Um, so lots of memories. And of course, you know when you're thrown into this, you don't know who the people are. Um, we had Steve Davis, who was the world, you know, the street of yeah. yeah. used to drive me nuts. <laughs> by, my, by my bunk bed, there was, a, there was a rock on the floor coming into camp. Every east of Tripper. Pick it up, Why do you think you could see it there? And there was one hot day, because don't think anyone, Australian gentlemen, it was the summer, boiling hot in, in Australia. And he was standing under a palm tree with a knotted handkerchief. I said, what do you think that's going to do? <laughs> <laughs> and, and all these, the, the, lots of memories, but you all say, you all get together, oh, we're going to keep in touch with it. You don't, do you? You work on a project, you're thrown together, you have a wonderful time, and then, of course, everybody disbands, really, you know, they get on with their life. Yeah. Um, I put it down to a wonderful experience, and, um, and you know what? Sometimes if you're, if you're thrown a challenge, go for it. Mm. Yes, I think that's yeah. a good lesson. Go for it. What have you got? You know, you can do it. Can you? I didn't think I could do it. I mean, did I like it? I don't think. And I had long hair then. I'm like, you couldn't wash your hair because it was cold water, yeah. <coughs> right? And you either had the pool. Oh. I, was, I was the first in the pool because I wanted to be clean. Or you had the water pool. The water pool was ice cold. <laughs> and so, of course, the manager, oh, we're not going there. You're too cold. I said, I like to be clean. You know. So. Um, <coughs> Yeah, when I came out, 
Uh, we, we, of course, you go to the, the Versace Hotel. Well, I was only there for one night. And then I was shipped back. <laughs> so when I came out, all my campmates looked completely, they were suntanned, hair glossy. I come out stinky. <laughs> you know, and that's all. So I was I had two hours under a shower trying to wash all the gunk out of my hair. But um, no, it, it's a challenge. And I thought, if I can get through this cancer, which I did, luckily, um, let's go for it. Yes. So I want to another person who's very up for a challenge, Barbara, <laughs> who you met when you were um, filming um, an episode of Say Yes to the Dress, yes. and you were in off um, wedding boots. That's right. I have so, did, did you ever see Say Yes to the Dress? Yes. Well, well I was, obviously, <laughs> it's an American show, and I was asked to be the first British host. I did 160 shows, so a lot of television. Wow. Yeah. And we used to film it, and we'd have two or three brides a day, and, and I loved it. But anyway, this request came through from Oxfam. Now, we were filming this shop in one of the shopping malls in Essex, and I said, well, what's this about? I said, I didn't know Oxfam did wedding dresses. Let's go, let's do it. Anything to get out of the shop, actually. <laughs> and, and that's the day that changed the thought, because I met Barbara, and I thought, this is a, and it was Barbara's idea, yeah. which I love, and it's wedding dress. So we went to Ch uh, Chippendon, Shippendon? Yes, yes. 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 And on the ground floor, as you walk into the shop there, there's the usual stuff, you know, pre-loved clothes, shoes, handbag, whatever. And then upstairs, they have a bridal department. I said, okay, immaculate. Everything immaculate. But what I loved about it, there's, uh, they had all the size tw 10 dresses in one column, all the size 12 in another column, all the size 14, and so on. So when I met these girls, they were obviously briefed and, and, and chosen. I said, right, ladies, have you ever been to an Oxfam shop before? No, but they love and they want to support Oxfam. I said, right. So I said, look this the lady up and down. I said, right, you're a 14. Right, let's go to the 14. I said, now, this is it. This is all we've got. So out of this, uh, you've got to choose something. And I did, I think I did about four, four brides that day, but the one that, that struck me, was, she was lovely, whippet thin, and I found a slip of satin by Escas, and she looked great. And I said, uh, you look fabulous in this dress. Now, some of the dresses are, are obviously donated from bridal companies. You, you might get a thousand pound gown for a hundred pounds. I'm just extraordinary. You know, it's very generous of them to give, and they're all dry cleaned, and they're all washed and beautiful. Anyway, I put it this way, I said, this is the dress for you, put it on, and she looked great. And I said, well, are you going to say yes to the dress? Yes! Mm -hmm. Right? And it was about, I think it was about a hundred pounds, I can't remember exactly. Anyway, I said, well, you need a bit of a day or something. I said, so when's the wedding? She told me who the wedding was. <coughs> I said, so what are you going to do? She said, it's quite simple. She said, I will wear this dress. And the second the wedding's over, I'll send her to be dry clean. And I'm going to donate it back to the store. Oh, amazing. Well, yeah. I looked turning around, all the ca the cameramen were sobbing, I was <laughs> sobbing. Because I thought it was such... She said, no, I will wear it and I'll have fun wearing it for that day, but I want somebody else mm -hmm. to enjoy it. And, well, it touched on my heart. I just went, oh! So, um, yes, I don't. I think they cut the bit out of me sobbing on television. <laughs> <laughs> but I just thought it was a wonderful point of view. You know, she wanted it, she wanted somebody else to have the pleasure as well, so I thought it was wonderful. Yes. And you've now got ten stores around the country, and if you can't, it like, it, but hang on, I've, I've done my homework here. <laughs> <laughs> I have done my homework. Um, should you be, no, that's not the one, they've got shops in Southampton, Kingston, Poole, Bradford, Coventry, Darlington, and Heswell. Now, if you can't go there, now, you're looking at me, look at the times we're in. Money is tight. And so often I'm told, oh, I can't spend. And the average dress for most brides these days is about £1,500. There's a lot of people who can't afford £1,500. So isn't this the perfect vehicle? I mean, it's so on point because it's about pre-loved dresses, recycling, and of course the other buzz with sustainability. It's all there with Oxfam. It's all there. Yeah. And I say to people, um, you know, if you're clever, look, you can walk into a store, buy a dress, 
Let's say it's 100 pounds. Let's say it's 150 pounds. That's a darn sight cheaper than 1,500 pounds. And if it doesn't quite work, you'll find a seamstress who can alter it. You can add a bit of this or add a bit of bling or buy a little belt or something. There's always something you can do. And you can make it very special. And it doesn't have to cost an arm and a leg. Now, if you can't get to those stores that I've read, I, online. And I was online yesterday looking. You know, you might have a niece, um, you know, a, a daughter, whoever. <coughs> Um, and I think it's a wonderful way. I'm talking myself at work here, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, 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 it is kind of extraordinary to think that because of this lady's idea, it's now gone round everywhere. I think that's wonderful. Um, and I think with a bit of creativity, you can. You can always twist some sunflowers in and make it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not there. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, it, it ticks all the boxes today. Yes. So when I hear brides say, well, I can't afford. And I often say to brides, you say, oh, um, we need another 500 pounds. If we're up to 1,500 pounds, but the, the gown's 2,000 pounds, right? I said, well, you know what to do. Cut the cocktails up, cut the coffees, <laughs> and by the time you have the gown, you will be able to afford it, you know. But it doesn't have to be expensive. Some women, very much they wear it on the day, forget about it, and you know, why not? Yes. And Barbara set up the first ever Oxfam wedding shop, didn't you? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Um, amazing. Yeah, amazing. 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 Yeah. Thank you so much for talking to us. I've just been wrapped <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, in supporting Oxfam. Um, no, well, again. wonderful Thank organization. Oh, by the way, another plug for Oxfam. Apart from wedding dresses, they do mothers of the bride. They do occasional wear, they do bridesmaids, so you can get the whole thing there. Now, I know a lot of you ladies rush out there, there's a wedding coming, oh, I've got nothing to wear. <laughs> well, go to Oxfam, darling, or go online and see what there is. It's very simple, great picture, price underneath, bingo. It saves you running around. <laughs> it just buys online. Yeah, cool. Check out the Oxfam online shop. Yeah. yeah nice. You're happy with that? Yeah. Uh, are, are, we, are we out of time? Feel free to Quick question, up. anybody? <coughs> this is not scheduled. Yes. <laughs> when you were designing the dress design, yes. it, how did you come up with that design? What, I mean, it was a question, it's a collaboration of the three of us, Elizabeth, myself, and Diana, right? We had gowns in, in our time at the studio, so we'd try on a bodice, try on a sleeve, and we'd work on sketches. And it's a question of, you know, I remember saying to her, we looked up our. Um, the history of wedding gowns, and I think the longest was 20 foot for a train. So we had a giggle mm -hmm. about it. I said, darling, the longest train, royal train, was 20 foot. I said, darling, it's St. Paul's, it's huge. Mm -hmm. I said, let's make it bigger. She goes, but do you think so? I said, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, please. <laughs> so he said, well, should we make it 22 foot? <laughs> should we make it 23? I said, no, no, no 25 foot. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, and this was how we made the point with that St. Paul's. And we ran up some polls and said, how wide is your aisle? And they said, oh, we've never been asked this question before. I said, but I need to know, you know, with the train. So we turned up and expected this particular, with a tape measure, well, you can imagine. We're measuring the width of the aisle, and there were crowds of people. So that had to be aborted very swiftly. But um, no, um, so really, it was a collaboration. You know, we were known, don't forget Emmanuel at that time was known for doing romantic ball gowns in, in, with the social ladies and Vogue View and, I mean, my first royal lady was Her Royal Highness the Duchess of Kent. This is before Diana. So we were in, kind of in that circle, but unknown. And my next royal was uh, Her Royal Highness Princess Michael of Kent. So they did, we had two royals under our belt before Diana came over, but you didn't know that. <laughs> um, and yes, I was very fortunate also, when I was at Cardiff, in my early days at Cardiff, um, when all the other fashion students were designing chunky jumpers and, and hand-stitching and felt skirts, I was doing silk chiffon. And, <laughs> <laughs> and my, head of, my head of fashion said, oh, David, you know, we've got to put you somewhere. Like, oh, we're lo a, a dark room with champagne. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I was very fortunate. I came up to London terribly nervous on the train with my portfolio. And I had an interview at Hardy Amy's. Mm -hmm. As you know, design clothes for Her Majesty the Queen, mm -hmm. Princess Margaret, 
and I did a summer there, and it changed my line. I could see how the Couture House ran. And so I, when I finished the summer, I had to go back to college. I said, well, thank you so much. He said, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going to go back to college. And he said, oh, we thought you were permanent. We thought you had a job here. I said, no, no, I've got to go back. My Welsh upbringing, you've got to get your certificate. <laughs> you've got to get your diploma. And then they invited me back for a second summer. And um, no, it was amazing training ground um, to see how. And he would, well, when, Miss, when Mr. Amy's arrived at South Row, God had arrived. <laughs> everybody stood to attention. And as he walked through, through, through the house, everybody went, I said, good morning. I think I was the only one who spoke to him. I used to say, good morning. And he said, oh, good morning. Who are you? I said, I'm just a fashion student. I'm just helping out, you know. Charming man. Uh, I learned a lot. So that was good, good breeding um, or good background before Diana came along, really. And um, I'm very lucky, no red tape. I was expecting a whole sheet from Buckingham Palace. You could do this, you could do that, but nothing. So Diana took a chance because mm. we were fresh out of college. Mm. She didn't know if we could do the gig. We didn't know until <laughs> yeah, I knew. <laughs> I knew we could do it. It's just a question of keeping calm. Mm -hmm. Keeping very calm, get everything organized, do all your prep, and uh, lots, of call, lots of calls to the silk farm, <laughs> lots of calls to, to the weavers. And we didn't, uh, we were very naughty, um, because we surrounded, our little studio was surrounded in Brook Street every day. So I had to go to a well-known department store on Oxford Street to buy roller blinds. <laughs> and I meet the, flat, the beauty editor from Vogue. And she said to me, David, what on earth are you doing? I said, I'm buying roller blinds. <laughs> because we, I mean, the people were everywhere. <laughs> they were on top of buildings trying to peer through the window. Wow. So we pulled the blinds down, and the blinds stayed down for the entire time. And, um, yeah, kind of memories like that. It's, it was a crazy time, uh, but we kept calm. Right at the centre of a huge historical event. Yeah, it? it wasn't until, and then, what was it, seven, eight hundred million people around the world had seen this, you know. Yeah. That was a big gig. <laughs> <laughs> okay, David, David, come, come from a man. I'm a man. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. how you actually do design. Yes. The significant thing is that you have to, when you're designing a dress for somebody, yes. you have to get behind the person. Oh, absolutely. You have to see totally. what their attributes are, what absolutely. their characteristics are. You've got to know. You've got to... I, the very first appointment is the most important, usually an hour. Yeah. I've got to sum up that person very quickly. You've got to know their taste, their thinking. And I always say, when's the gig? Where are you, where are you going? Yeah. Is it a 50th birthday, 60, whatever it is? And try to find their personality and, and but, who but, they. But, but amazingly, I was watching a, a documentary on Leonardo da Vinci. Oh yes. And Leonardo da Vinci had to paint certain people for camps. Yeah. But he got behind the person. That's right. To make sure that the expression that he was painting on the face didn't please the count, mm -hmm. didn't make the person look happy. Yeah. But the, how the person was feeling themselves. Correct. And he su achieved such perfection like yeah. that. Yeah. And it just struck me as a similar kind of approach that he had yeah. to what you had. And his yeah. last dress or Salvador money was sold for about four hundred and fifty million pounds. Wow. So the best of luck. <laughs> Is all these women here are completely different. So if they want to come to me for a gown, well, I've got to know the woman first of all. Find out, is it a cocktail dress? Is it an evening? What is it? And, and it's all to do with, put, you can do the most extravagant dress, but you can put on a quiet lady, mm. it's not going to work. Mm. But equally, I have a flamboyant character. Well, there's flamboyant. And when they say to me, I want something glamorous, I say, well, there's glamour and there's glamour. Now, how glamorous do you want it? Do you know when you walk in like it with a bride, if she walks into the church or whatever it is, do you want to be, I said, I want people to weep. I want people to sob. You know. And 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 it's um, it's getting to know the person. Absolutely right. And I mean all you are very every woman is different, every taste is different, 
And I obviously wouldn't put the same dress on all, you know, you're not going to have the same dress for me, because I, I don't work like that. So it's, yeah, you're absolutely right, it's getting to know the person and the personality. And you're welcome, of course, so you understand. <laughs> oh, but of course. <laughs> <laughs> So we didn't even want the weavers to know what colour we were using. And the naughty bit, the naughty bit was the, the, the press were relentless, ringing up, pretending to be future clients, and, and they were members of the press, you know, no, no, I know you, out. And um, one bit, so we used to deliberately, and this way I deliberately put pale pink um, taffeta in the bins, because they were rubbish in the bins, and the next day, it's going to be pink! <laughs> got involved to realise how serious this was. You know, it was a big occasion, and we just lived through another big occasion, hungry, we? goodness me. Mm -hmm. What an immaculate presentation. Mm -hmm. Exhausted to watch. I watched it in, because I'm just outside Windsor, but um, no, magical. They did a great job, you know. So that was a big occasion. Everything has to be perfect. The guys who I think should be omelette are the guys who carried that coffee. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. 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 The responsibility. Jeepers. Oh, I, I know throughout the day, did you notice Ooh. they were there at the beginning? Yeah. They were there taking it off the plane. Yeah. Oh my goodness me. Mm. That was amazing. But um, um, one question you were going to ask me, was this only dead or alive? I wish I'd done something for Majesty of the Queen. Mm -hmm. I wish. I didn't have an opportunity. But when I said Hardy Amy's, they were designing a lot of gowns for Her Majesty of the Queen. So I used to see the artists there. I said, what are you working on, Joan? She goes, oh. I said, what? <laughs> Something that we, oh, let me have a look. And, and, and she actually bought a colour, did big, big sketches. Hardy used to, uh, Mr. Amos used to sign them, and uh, used to go off. And then, of course, Her Majesty used to go through them and send back little notes. Uh, what, little adjustments she wanted. And um, so I feel as though I've been part of that. But no, I never, she'd be, she would have been wonderful to have dressed. But um, yeah. It wasn't to happen. So. You looked immaculate, didn't you? Like, oh, you didn't do so bad. <laughs> I'm so <okay. laughs> Yeah. Oh, well, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Because 
This is your opportunity. David may even sign it. Would you sign it? If they're nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, so there, there, mm. there are some books. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Lovely. Yes, thank you. I'm just going to get a cup of coffee now. <laughs> 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 <laughs>